Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. My guest today is Dorian Anderson. You might know Dorian from his epic 2014 Biking for Birds adventure, which was a nearly 18,000-mile, 365-day bicycle-only trip around the United States. In case that wasn't enough, the trip's goal was to see as many bird species as possible, what's known as a big year. Dorian used this adventure to raise awareness for birds and their habitats, raise money, and launch a personal life change. He demonstrated that you can pull off a big year without a big budget and in a carbon-friendly way. And as you'll hear, Dorian's story leading up to that monumental task is equally interesting. We discussed Dorian's framework for taking on new projects and new risk, how he prepared for the 365 days on a bike, his amazing photography, and what project he has in flight that we can look forward to. So without further delay, here's my interview with Dorian Anderson. Thank you, Dorian, for doing this today. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me, Michael. I'm really looking forward to chatting this afternoon. So I hinted already at one of the things that you're best known for, and that was the Biking for Birds Big Year. Mm -hmm. And that's just an astonishing achievement to spend an entire year. How many miles was it? Oh, well, thank you for first off. Uh, It ended up being 17,830 miles, give or take. I mean, I had to kind of map my routes on Google each day, but... 18,000 miles, give or take. So it ended up being about 50 miles a day. If you, I think my average was 49 point something or other, including days I didn't ride. Uh, so when you average it all out, it was about 50 miles a day for 365 consecutive days. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Through all kinds of weather as well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I started in Massachusetts. It was 10 degrees below zero when I started, and I got 20 inches of snow on the second day. So... I, uh, I was delayed actually on January 2nd and 3rd. I was housebound at my host's house while they cleared the roads. And then I could get going again on the 4th. And it was brutal. But I started in the cold knowing that it would be as bad as it would get at the outset. And then it got better as I moved south from there down the eastern seaboard. So well, I think I'll dig into some of those challenges that you had yeah, a little yeah, bit more definitely. in a minute. Um, but I, I'm curious, what led up to this event? Like, I don't think someone wakes up one day and says, I'm going to get on my bike and look for as many birds as I can for 365 days. Can you give me a little bit of the background as to how you came to this? Point yeah, it's, it's, a bit it? of a, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll try to condense it. I've, I've been a lifelong birder. I started birding when I was seven years old, and just in my backyard. I found it on my own. And that interest was super intense until I was on 15 or 16 and when I went to prep school. And then I was just totally consumed with work and extracurricular activities and the whole college process. Through high school, and then I'm pretty open about this. Uh, I'm an alcoholic, and so once I discovered alcohol at age 17, birding like fell into this distant background. And so from age 17 to 30, ironically, through my academic trajectory through Stanford and then my time at uh, NYU, I was like a full blown alcoholic and and hard drug user. And so my focus was more on partying and my my concurrent DJ interest. And so birding kind of fell out. During those years, and then I got sober when I was 30 and kind of revisited birding in the vacuum of partying as something to as something to keep my mind occupied and something to give my life structure outside of bars. And I ended up to, after NYU, I got my PhD at NYU in developmental genetics, and molecular cell biology. I moved to Boston to do a postdoctoral fellowship at MGH and Harvard Medical School in molecular neuroscience. And I got three years into that. I got two years into that and was like. I don't know if I want to keep going down this road. It's super intense. Funding keeps contracting. It's super competitive. I find that I'm living in my lab. Like when my wife traveled, I would sleep in the lab. And I was looking for a way out, but biotech wasn't attractive to me. And I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to step into like a secondary education arena. I didn't know what I wanted. So I, I, I guess you could say I had my midlife crisis. And what actually gave me the idea, so that's the background. But what the actual spark was is Hurricane Sandy deposited a number of northern lapwings on the island of Nantucket in early November of 2012. So that was right at the end of my second postdoctoral year. And I had never seen a northern lapwing. And as as a relatively renewed, diehard North American lister at that time, I was like, I have to go see these birds. I didn't realize like another 20 were going to be dumped up and down the eastern seaboard in the course of the next month or discovered in the wake of the storm. But I went out to Nantucket, and the only way that I could actually get from the ferry dock to the birds at that time of year was to rent a bicycle from a local shop. And so I rented a bike and biked to go see these northern lapwings. And it was fun. I mean, it was only about five miles each way. But on the ferry on the way back, I didn't want to put my car on the ferry because it was like 500 bucks. So that's why I ended up renting the bike instead. 
I thought about has anybody like has anybody ever done any kind of birding biking hybrid project? And so I did a couple of internet searches and found some found some projects that had been had been done by others, but nobody had actually undertaken a bicycle big year. And so that was the genesis of this. It was the the kind of my academic frustrations and research frustrations kind of primed the system that when these lap wings showed up and I rented the bicycle to go see them. I conjured the whole bicycle big year as a way to make a very personal exit from science during which I could go and think about what I wanted out of the rest of my life. So it's kind of a long answer to a very short question, but there's a bunch of stuff tying into it. When you started, then you weren't quite sure where it was going to take you. You just knew that taking that break and giving you that time that that was going to open up some doors and maybe give you some clarity as to what your next step would be. Exactly. Yeah, I knew... I knew I, I, I the reason one of the reasons I selected the bicycle. There's the environmental reason, which I'm sure that we'll return to uh, later in our discussion. But I also I needed some headspace. I needed to unplug, and what better way to do it than to spend anywhere from five to twelve hours alone on the bicycle each day? Uh, outside of the bicycle, I bird it alone most of the time as well. So I just wanted to kind of take my interest and 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 kind of binge on it the same way I used to binge on alcohol and drugs and just kind of see what happened. And I didn't know to what it would lead. Um, I figured that I'd probably have enough cool stories to write a book and I'm almost finished with that project now. But yeah, that was, I just kind of wanted to go and find myself and as you said, find some clarity and figure out what I wanted. And then I've been able to kind of spin that that stunt into not necessarily a full-time career, but certainly a, a part-time career that's still gathering steam, kind of in the bird and photography arena. Right. Um, I'll definitely dig into that a bit more. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious also a little bit about the logistics leading up to this, because I, I think when I imagine even just doing a short backpacking trip, I spend a lot of time preparing myself, understanding where I'm going to be, uh, where my water options are, where I can get food, where, I can, mm -hmm. where I'm going to stay. What was the preparation like for something as long as a big year? The biggest thing was the route because unlike a traditional big year where – and I think that it's important. A big year is basically a project that different birders will undertake. Uh, it's informal competition to see how many species of birds you can see in one year. And people do this at the county level, the state level, uh, the country or continent level, and even the world level. But the North American big year tends to be the industry standard because it's been around for the, a long time. You get to explore kind of the home continent of North America, which is actually defined as, when I did it, as the lower 48 states, all of Canada, and all of Alaska. It's since come to include Hawaii. Mexico is never included in that. Their avifauna is probably more closely linked to Central America than it is to North America. Yeah, that, that's what a big year is. But usually these people who do them either drive or fly. And so they can, they can move around the continent really, really fast. So if a, rare, if a birder is in New York and a rare bird is reported in L.A., the person literally just drives over or takes a cab over to, LA or to JFK and buys a $2,000 plane ticket to fly to LAX. So I, I could never pick up the pen. So the biggest preparation for me was was figuring out what the route was. Because once I set to it, I couldn't make big big adjustments. I could only make like regional or local tweaks to my national route. So I literally sat down with the field guide and tried to figure out how many birds I could see and where I could go to the fewest number of locations to see those birds. So I ended up kind of realizing that I had to go to New England in the winter and I had to go to Florida at some point in the year. And I had to go to Texas in the spring and I had to go to Arizona between the spring and the summer and I needed to be in California in the fall which meant that I should fill in the summer with the Rocky Mountains and then after California in the fall I could return to South Texas at the end of the year so by sitting down and kind of figuring out where the birds are going to be and then performing a riding calculation to figure out the shortest trace to connect the appropriate regions at the appropriate times of year I generated my route and nobody had done this before so there was no blueprint that I could use as, as, a, as a benchmark, so to speak. So that's, that was the biggest part of the planning was getting the route nailed down. Beyond that, there's not much you can do because you can't say I'm going to go here on this day and there on that day and there on that day and have, and have a month itinerary laid out because as, as I told you, I got two feet of snow on January 2nd and 3rd, and so I had to throw my plan for January 2nd and 3rd out the window. And I didn't do a couple of things that I wanted to do on those days. 
So you can only really plan two or three days ahead because of weather and wind and how you're feeling physically and so on and so forth. So a lot of it is you just kind of have to get on the bike and start pedaling and trust that it's going to work out one way or another. You get to your destination at night, wherever that may be, and then you have a couple day window that you're looking ahead. Exactly. For. Yeah. Did you did you find yourself studying about the birds you were expecting to see? Fortunately, because I had such a oh I'd say a wide base of birding experience from my youth, um, and I had done a bit of bird motivated travel in the years after I got sober. I had a pretty good grasp on the national birding landscape. I'm not an outstanding birder by any stretch of the imagination, although I've gotten a lot better since my big year. That that really, when you spend a whole year birding, it really helps. But I, I knew what I would see where and when. I was familiar enough, as I said, with the birding landscape that I was in good shape in that department. Obviously, differentiating a willow flycatcher from an alder flycatcher, if you don't hear them, is virtually impossible. Uh, but... Minus a few very, very specific but difficult ID challenges, I felt relatively prepared to manage the birds. I didn't feel like that was going to be that was going to be the biggest issue. The biggest issue was going to be the cycling because I had never done any cycling before this. Once I decided to do this, I bought a bike, a junky bike in Boston, and started riding the seven miles to and from my laboratory each day. But I had never undertaken a bike ride more than twenty five miles when I got on the bike and rode twenty six, twenty seven miles on the first day of my adventure. And I'd never ridden a bike with stuff strapped all over it. So I had all my gear and stuff. So that was that was a big adjustment as well as learning how to manage the bike at the outset of the year. So so not only was it a uh, a bit of a mental adjustment to just kind of focus on this, but physiologically it mm-hmm. must have been substantial those first few weeks when you were uh, for the first time riding like that. Yeah. What was both good and bad is it it was so cold and I got so much snow in the first month. As I moved, in the first month, I basically moved from Boston down the eastern seaboard to just south of D.C., but it was so cold because of the polar vortex. It was actually the coldest January on record in the United States, the year that I selected to do this bike trip. Yeah, that was, I think, one of the first years that polar vortex came into the Yeah, that was the year that the the term was coined. (laughs) Um, But what that did is it limited my, my time on the bike, so it forced, it forced me to keep my miles low lest I freeze to death. And it forced me off of the roads completely on those days when it snowed. I mean, I had two or three different storms that dumped a foot on me as, as I progressed. And so I'd lose the day or two after that. And as an addict, I'm not terribly good about regulating output or intake. That's, that's what the definition of the disease is. And so Mother Nature kind of assumed that responsibility for me by periodically snowing on me at the outset and keeping my miles low. A bicycle big year isn't like a marathon where you train for six months and then you rest You rest for a week or 10 days beforehand and then you go and you do it and you're done, right? Like this is every day for an entire year. And so you didn't want to train for a year to ride for a year. So I, did, I didn't do a ton of training, so to speak. I just rode my bike to and from work. And I was an active runner at the time, so I was in good shape. Um but burnout, like load management was really, really important over the course of the year. And the weather at the outset of the year helped me by keeping my miles low. So were, were you conscious of that fact at the time that Mother Nature was kind of helping you out, helping you regulate the expenditure at the beginning? Not so much at the beginning. Looking back, I realized that it was helpful. I, I was super frustrated because all, I was excited. Everything was new. The novel, the novelty of the bicycle wore off at some point in the year when I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to get back onto this damn thing. Uh, but at the beginning of the year, it was just I just wanted to go, go, go and get into a good rhythm. So it was frustrating being stopped periodically. But at the same time, when I looked back on it, I said, hmm, you know what, this this ended up working out really well because I don't have the discipline to schedule the downtime for myself. You can tell by the way I talk. I'm really energetic. I don't sleep a lot. I don't. This is me. I don't drink coffee. It wouldn't be fair to the rest of the world if I if I drank coffee because I'm such a spaz already <laughs> that that it would just be like overload. So I just I'm go 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 all the time in everything that I do. So sitting down was hard. Yeah. yeah. So that frustration you had at the beginning with the weather, uh, did that lead to thoughts of quitting? Uh, or was, was there ever a point in your big year where you really were seriously thinking that this is just too much, I'm, I'm done? No. Th- there, were, there were individual episodes like headwinds. Headwinds, like 
every hill ends at some point and you're afforded a view from the top, whether it be semi semi distant or like spectacular, you're afforded a view. Whereas wind feels like the, the universe is actively conspiring against you to stop you from doing what it is that you're trying to do. And I had a couple of like roadside meltdowns where I like threw the bike on the ground and threw my helmet into a field and like walked down the highway or walked down the country road where I was because of headwinds or threw a rock at a road sign. There's one time in Texas, I just got so frustrated. I started throwing rocks at a stop sign and like it was all dented by the time I was done. But so I, I was super frustrated for like 10 minutes at a time. And then I, I like exploded and had my adult tantrum and then calmed down. But there was no time in the year that I thought about quitting. I thought that I had this plan in my head. My family lives in Philadelphia. And so I said, the first three weeks, month to three weeks, will basically be the prototype. And if I can survive riding from Boston through New York and on to Philly, then I can continue for there. So that I, I thought, if all else fails, I can hang it up at my parents' house and say, this was a terrible idea. Um, and then kind of regroup from that familiar port. But... Once I got there, I said, I can, this, I can scale this. What I've done can be scaled over the rest of the year. The riding is going to get easier because I'm not going to be dealing with the cold and the ice. Uh, it will get more challenging in some respects because I'd be upping my daily miles and gaining altitude and spending more time at elevation. But getting to that first month was really, really key, especially because I, it would have been easier for a car to slide off the road and run me over and so on and so forth at any point in the Northeast. Well, I'm certain there were many roads that were not the best for bicycles <laughs> that you probably had to, to uh, traverse throughout the year. How many birds did you end up seeing? I ended up seeing 618. I guess that's like the standing self-powered record at this stage. Um, I wasn't really in it to break any records. I was, I was in it to push myself to see how many birds I could see personally. Um, there wasn't a record. I guess there was. I shouldn't say that. That short changes Mark. There's a guy. He's a really cool guy. Mark Kudrov, who lives here in California, who had done a bicycle big year the year before, but it was mainly, con it was entirely contained in California. Um, and I didn't actually know about this until I started my year and somebody filled me in on, somebody filled me in about it saying, oh, Mark got 300 and I think he got 326 when it was all said and done. Um, and that was probably a month, probably two, two and a half months in. And so then I ended up passing Mark in another month after that. So I passed Mark in, in mid April, but that's because I was changing geographies and my returns didn't diminish nearly as quickly as did his, as did his. And you can you really can't compare our two efforts. Like I ended up accruing more species because I, I had more time to cover more different habitats. It's not, I didn't do anything more than just pedal further, but that was facilitated by quitting my job whereas he did his big year around his job, which is in many ways more impressive. Yeah, that is impressive. So, uh I guess for the listeners, a little additional comparison, those people that you mentioned earlier that will hop on an airplane to oh, go see yeah, a rare yeah. bird, they may get in the low 700s if they're very committed to a big year. Like that's where the records are, I think, for, yeah, for big so years. Everything has changed because they, since I did mine, they've now included Hawaii in the big year territory. And so there's the old school records and then in the last five to six years have been like the establishment of these these newer records and so i actually don't know what the north american big year record is off the top of my head i'll be 100 percent honest in that i'm just not as interested i don't pay attention to effectively people with a lot of means they're all wonderful people and i'm good friends with a lot of the big year birders but at the end of the day it's just a contest it's a travel contest and Money fuels that. And so there's not a lot of mystery as to who's going to see the most birds. It's going to be he or she who spends the most money. And so I haven't really followed any of the big years since, since my bicycle big year because I, I don't find it that interesting. It's a really great personal project for those folks, but the record is, is just indicative of how much money was invested, not necessarily anything else. Yeah, no, I, I understand. So, you know, I'm also a fairly driven person, maybe not quite as much as you from, uh, <laughs> from what you're describing. Uh, you know, so I like the list. I like to see how uh -huh. many birds I can see, but ultimately I go out in nature because it's, it's a form of meditation for mm -hmm. me. It allows me to put everything else to the side and just be in the moment. And, uh, you know, for me personally, I don't think I would ever fly around the country or the world chasing, mm -hmm. you know, chasing a number. Uh, I, you know, I might, I might choose to do something more like what you did at mm -hmm. some point, but, uh, but not 
adding on the stress of airports and it, money and you know everything. I mean, else. I think that like I think Noah Stryker, who did this World Big Year a couple of years ago, I, I really liked that idea because he was kind of using his big year to build international community. But the bigger thing is that his returns never diminished because he would move to new countries, and so he he added species. I haven't seen a graph of this, but I'm just kind of surmising this. I imagine he added species at a relatively linear rate over the course of the entire year, whereas in these North American big years, these guys and gals find their 700 species by June, and then the second half of the year is is spent trying to get like anywhere from another 40 to 80. I think the big year record is somewhere like 770, 780 or something now, at least for like the traditional ABA area. But those each of those additional 50 is an individual plane flight and that might be an individual plane flight to alaska and then an individual plane flight to texas and so the returns diminish so quickly that you're that you end up flying for one or two birds at a time whereas in in the world big years you you don't have that and it's actually they fly less in the world big years they generate less emissions in the world big years because they don't their returns don't diminish and they can just move by moving countries or by moving continents as opposed to going to Alaska eight times to right. see eight individual trips to Alaska, which is what a lot of a lot of big year birders will do. Yeah, Noah's book is uh, is amazing, and I'll make sure I link to that mm-hmm. too in the show notes. Um, he not only optimized in terms of minimal travel while going around the globe, mm-hmm. but also really assimilated him his, the cultures into his process. Yeah, which, yeah, which was very interesting to see. He had local help, stayed with local people, local transportation. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think very, that very interesting approach. And and I I liken Noah's year a bit to mine in that respect because he ended up staying with a, lo- a lot of local people. I had to rely on the American public to take care of me as I biked around. So not only did the birding community rally, but the cycling community and a lot of the people that I, I was fortunate in that I, I went to school. I mean, I went to high school in the Northeast. I went to college in California, and then I went to grad school back in the Northeast. And those schools were big names that attracted from all over the country and then repopulated the rest of the country with, with their graduates. And so I had this great network of alumni from high school, undergrad, and NYU when I did this. I I got to stay with people, whereas a normal big year birder will just fly into town, rent a car, and stay in a hotel. I stayed with people. I stayed with all kinds of crazy folks and really welcoming folks all over the U.S. I mean, everybody was welcoming. Some were crazy on top of that. Uh, but... A lot of my story is, is the story of the folks that I met along the way. And that's true in any big year. I think that I think that if you ask any big year birder, world, petroleum, biking, any permutation, they're all going to tell you that the people were the best part of it. And that, that's ultimately why you end up undertaking adventures like this. Hey, nature enthusiast. Do you want to be part of something bigger? Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. Did you, by chance, um, keep track of your cost throughout the year? Yeah, so my cost, the whole thing cost me about 15000 bucks. Uh, that's what I paid out of my pocket. Now, my wife, who works in corporate travel, secured me a a generous six thousand dollars from Best Western um, in terms of a voucher that I used at different points in the year. So I spent about sixty nights with Best Western at about a hundred dollars a night. That would bring the total cost of my adventure to twenty one thousand. Now, unlike a lot of other folks who will quote a number, most of what most big year birders won't quote you a number because it's so high that it's 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 not embarrassing, but it's it's it, it shows exactly what kind of means are invested into this. Um, but they don't they quote their travel. Uh, they subtract out the flights that were paid for with miles. They don't account for food, right? I that includes all of my food for the whole year. That includes 
my bicycle that includes all my bike tune-ups along the way that includes everything that's what the the whole thing cost me 21,000 you, you lived for a year for 21,000 yeah exactly yeah. and I mean I had tons of help people fed me as I moved around but and people sheltered me as I as I moved around as well but I think considering what else you could spend 21,000 bucks on I think that it was pretty much the adventure of a lifetime yeah, that's so. that's amazing, and I know I, the, this discussion so far it's been largely about you and and what you did, but along the way you were raising money as well for uh, for a few different groups. Is that yeah, right? I ended up raising so I thought I could raise a hundred thousand bucks, but that was a bit optimistic. So I ended up raising half that. Um, I ended up raising fifty thousand, and eighty percent of that went to the conservation fund, which is a conservation organization that targets specific patches of land for specific uh, reasons. Usually we are trying to purchase this piece of land to help preserve this specific species. So that was one of the organizations that I worked with. And then I also donated 20% of my total to the American Birding Association, who is kind of a clearinghouse for all things American birding. They promote listing, outdoor education, um, bird-related travel, anything and all things birding. So they're just a, a really well-run, well-motivated, like visible organization mm-hmm. in the North American birding community. So like if you put a business hat on, that's a, a huge return on investment right there. Just from yeah, like exactly. a dollar standpoint. And then along the way, um, I, I believe I read that, that you were also interviewed by some local media. There were various, various other ways in which you were able to engage with the public and raise some awareness about yeah, the exactly. birds that exist, maybe that people weren't thinking about or didn't realize were just right down the road from where they live. Yeah, and I think that I, I was fortunate in that once news of this nutcase on the bicycle got out, there was enough momentum that people found me and wanted to talk to me uh, as I went along. Um, and I also did some stuff. I, I did an interview with the Audubon Society, which helped. And Victor Emanuel Nature Tours was really great because they ended up matching. They had like a, a three-day match window where they would match up to like $2,500 of donations. So people could donate through an online portal kind of traditional style. But they helped with promotion. The ABA did a lot of promotional stuff. So it was it was really nice to see the community get involved. Another big year birder, Christian Hagenlocker, I think it was two years after I did my big year, did something similar where he – He really wanted to involve the community and so he did some volunteer work as he moved around and he just put a he just put a really a different spin on the big year he was he was funds limited which made it a bit a bit more interesting right like the more limits that you put on the big year the more interesting it gets because if you just give somebody five hundred thousand bucks and it's like go see as many species as you can you know what the outcome is going to be so christian's project was cool because he, he really he really tried hard to involve the community uh in all the areas that he went so that was really cool so what do you think after all of this you mentioned at the, at the onset you weren't entirely sure where this would lead uh, what was the most unexpected door that this opened for you one of the things that came out of it was that i did a ton of blogging as i moved around the country i wrote ev- every single night except the like 10 or 11 nights where I stayed in places that didn't have internet. And so my blog became this ritual for a lot of people in the birding community. And so that really, really built a personality and a brand for me. Um, And so when I got off the bike, because I had this big social media reach within the birding world, I got invited to go and on a lot of, a lot of international trips to kind of help shine the spotlight on a number of different international destinations like Belize and Guatemala and Extremadura and Spain and Taiwan. So it kind of snowballed in that respect and that I got to do a lot of travel I wasn't anticipating. But I think that, I, I don't necessarily know if it's lent me credibility. I don't think that doing a big year lends credibility. I think that the best your best birders aren't big year birders are the people that you don't hear about who like know their local areas super, super well. But it definitely like having a having a visible persona was great. I think the biggest thing that came out of it was was my association with the Audubon Society. So I ended up going to Columbia with them twice in 2016, helping them on this project where they are designing a number of different birding trails or itineraries within the country, within the new stabilized country, I should say, as a way to promote birding and ecotourism as a sustainable form of economic development. So I went kind of as a as a guinea pig to test two of the first, the first two trails that, that Audubon 
put together in collaboration with the Colombian government and a number of different uh, international aid agencies. And then some chips fell the right way, and a friend of mine, Alvaro Jaramillo, who I've actually worked with here in the Bay Area, proposed that I write the trails, the third and fourth iteration in the series. And so I actually spent eight weeks in Colombia uh, over the summer of 2018. Uh, and I got to get into a lot of areas that a lot of a lot of foreigners haven't been. Um, I saw a lot of amazing birds, experienced Colombian culture in a really unique way. Uh, it was just me and a guide. I was always with like two or three people. So we were in a car. Everything was like, super accessible. It was it was a really cool way to see the country. So I think that 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 project and my involvement in it really opened a lot of doors. And then that got me some experience in, in South America. And I've since been to Ecuador. And with my time in Central America, I now feel like I have a decent grasp on on near tropical avifauna. And so I can use that as leverage to now lead tours down there. So, well, that, that was actually something I was going to ask about because I've seen that you've led some tours uh, with uh, Alvaro. Yes, actually. that's right. Yeah. Um, and I will link to his uh -huh. site as well. He, he runs Pelagics here locally and yeah, also exactly. has a number of great international tours every year. So when Audubon asked you to get involved with the Columbia project, I, 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 I want to connect the dots a little bit more. Why you? Did they did they say, oh, this guy is a good planner. He uh, you know, he kind of understands how to approach these things or something else. That so happened? they they had the first time I got invited. What happened was is is they were putting together a group of people of about, I don't know, eight, eight Americans or so to come down and kind of demo this. As I said, this northern Colombia birding trail, which runs along the Caribbean coast of, of Colombia. And I actually got an, an email from a friend of mine, George Armistead, who explained what the project is. I didn't know about it at the time. And he said, they need somebody who can both write and photograph and also has some kind of social media reach. And so when they asked me who I knew who would fit that bill, I threw them your name and said, do you want to do this? And that was a pretty no brain question in that, at that stage. So... It was basically a friend recommended me that that first time, and then that went well. So then Audubon asked me to go back later in the year in 2016, and that went well as well. And so then the opportunity came up again on somebody else's, on, on Alvaro's recommendation. He had been very involved in the, the first two trials but couldn't deal with three and four at the time. And so mm -hmm. he kind of said, here, do you want to do this? And I said, yeah, that would be awesome. So it's the same old story where, getting your foot in the door is the hardest part but once you get your foot in the door and you do a good job and you demonstrate a, a skill set uh, I mean a lot of people can photograph and a lot of people can write but there aren't as many people who can do both things same thing with birding and photography there are a lot of really good birders and a lot of very good photographers but there is very very little overlap between those two communities and so if you can draw on a couple of different skills that gives you a bit more reach than anyone within those individual arenas has, then that's always a good thing. Right. And and then your trip, you were able to demonstrate day in, day out, your riding skill, uh, your persistence, your birding skill. Mm -hmm. uh, so that really established it did. It did lend credibility to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, when you write, I mean, I, I, I'm always curious if I were to like print out my blog into like printed pages, how long it would be. I mean, I wrote, anywhere from 500 to 1,000 words almost every day for the entire year. So, I mean, how much is 200,000 words? I mean, that's a six or 700-page book at that yeah, stage. Substantial. So, yeah. <laughs> so after, after having gone through all of that, would you ever consider doing something like that again? Yeah, there is a lot of talk. I have the most supportive wife ever. So she wasn't my wife at the time. We were dating at the time. I had met her in New York. She was ended, the reason I ended up getting sober kind of at the end of graduate school. A long story that we won't get into. That is told in gory detail in the book that I'm writing. But she saw that I was struggling once I got, once I was w working as a postdoc. So she moved to Boston with me when I accepted the position at MGH and Harvard. And she, as I was experiencing, so I came up with the idea, I told you, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. And I kind of sat on it through that winter, through the winter of 2012, 2013. Like, oh, should I do this? I don't want to fold my academic hand. Like, I've done really well up until this stage, but I don't know if I want to continue down this road. And there was this, like, six-month period of waffling. And my wife, 
sat me down and she's like, you should go and do this bike trip. I will wait for you while you do it. And so she waited the year while I did it. She did some traveling on her own. But to get back to the original question, she's super supportive and has signed off on me basically taking the bike internationally now to ride the bike to other places. So I, I think the first project I'm going to try to do, I'd like to do it in the next year once this book is done, is ride my bike from Mexico to Panama uh, through Central America, birding, photographing, blogging, talking about sustainable economic development. I think that given the political situation in this country right now, which will hopefully change uh, at the end of the year, uh, there's been a lot of bad press about Central American countries. And the time that I've spent in Honduras has been wonderful. The time I've spent in Costa Rica, Belize, El Salvador. I've been fortunate to be to, to visit all these countries, and it's really been wonderful. And I think it would be great to be able to bring bring the American public with me on my bike, do more video blogging, and give people a boots-on-the-ground view of what it actually looks like in these Central American countries. So there'd be a birding slant, but also using the bike as a mechanism to build international community. Now that I have an in with the Audubon Society, I've been thinking about trying to do something to help them cross-promote their Columbia venture. Like, it would be really cool to ride from... I'd love, I'd love to ride the entire Andes. I don't think my wife would sign off of me being gone for six months that it would take to do that. But I think that if I proposed like riding from Colombia to Peru over eight to ten weeks, she'd be fine with that, or like a loop or around Scandinavia for six weeks or something. So that would be the goal: would be to to do like one trip each year where I can go and take the bike somewhere else and use it use it as a way to build international community. That sounds like it could be phenomenally productive. Like right now, so many of those countries are realizing how important ecotourism can mm-hmm. be compared to maybe some of the other economic incentives that they've had previously. And having something like that happening at this point in time would probably launch several more initiatives in those areas. That just sounds amazing. It would be a lot of fun. And it's nice because I have connections after my, I have connections in the Colombian tourism ministry. I have connections in the Belize tourism ministry from my time there. So I've met a lot of people along the way who, who can help us point people in each of these various countries. And then the, the pipe dream is that it snowballs to the point that that countries then contact you and they say, we want you to come here. Like that's the dream, right? Like somebody says, we will fly you and your bike here and give you some support and you bike, you just bike around and do your thing and, and we'll foot the bill and just give us PR. That's the dream. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get there, but we'll see. Well, best of luck in that yeah. dream. So you did mention your blog, uh, the speckled hatchback and in reading your blog, that's actually a metaphor. Do you want to talk a little bit about the the name? Yeah, the so the Speckled Hatchback, it's funny. The blog is, it's it's mostly a, an online journal. Like, there is some actual content on there. Like, and when I travel to other countries, I write up, this is how one would go about visiting country X if you haven't been there. Like, these are the logistics you need to consider, blah, blah, blah. So all of that is embedded in there. A lot of it is kind of my bike birding adventures around the Bay Area. But the blog is called The Speckled Hatchback. And when I was like 11 or 12 years old, I played on a local ice hockey team down the street from my house. And like the dudes, the dudes in the locker room one day were like razzing me about bird watching. They weren't giving me a hard time. But this one guy, RP, his name was RP Urban. And I, I played hockey with the guy for like six years. I have no idea what RP stands for. But that was his name was RP Urban. And so RP was like kind of giving me a hard time in the locker room after game one day. And he's like, dude, what do you do? Like go sit in the woods and like sit there quietly and wait for the speckled hatchback to go cheap, cheap, cheap. And I didn't think about it at the time, but like RP had, had zero experience with bird watching. It was kind of pulling my chain, but he had conjured this, this image of this completely believable bird name, the speckled hatchback. And so I used that as a metaphor, or as a stand in title when I, when I came up with this blog, the, the speckled hatchback is something for which you're always looking, but you're never going to find, right? It's this kind of like, it's the unicorn. It's, it's the, it's the, un, it's the dream that can't be realized, but that kind of keeps you motivated the whole way through. So it was a way of kind of like reaching back to my childhood birding interest, but then using this name as a metaphor for motivation to keep you going into the future and your birding or outdoor, whatever quest. I mean, let's be honest, you're not going to read my blog if you're not interested in birds uh, <laughs> the programming is very bird heavy. I mean, there's a lot of photography and some travel stuff in there, but it's not going to attract like new moms and monster truck fans. Let's be honest. Uh, maybe you'll get some car people though. Hatchback. Yeah. Um. Yeah. If you Google <laughs> speckled hatchback, you get this like one hideous car and then you get the blog right after that. I, hopefully the blog is ahead of that at this stage. Nice. So in a way then the speckled hatchback 
the name, the metaphor, it seems to also, at least in my view, relate to risk a little bit. You said it's something that you can maybe never achieve, but you can strive for. I'm curious, your big year sounds pretty risky. Uh, some of the plans you have, there's a little bit of risk yeah, in, definitely. involved there. What uh, do, you, do you have a framework for assessing risk? Like what m makes a risk worth taking in your mind? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because in the book I write a lot about, like I have to constantly reassess risk as I move along. And like one of the things I realized is that I actually got hit by a car when I was in Florida. Um, uh, just somebody wasn't paying attention and made, made a right turn and just clobbered me down in Ocala. And I survived that, but like in the wake of that, I, and I almost got clobbered several, se probably six or seven times in the course of the year within like three or four feet of getting hit. I was only actually hit one time. So you have to manage the physical risk, but you also have to, I thought a lot about the risk wasn't on America's roads. The risk was back in my laboratory because had I stayed there, I risked pushing more time into a pursuit, uh, which I was good, but wasn't necessarily destined to satisfy me. And so a lot of people look at the risk on the bicycle, whereas I look at the risk of not being on the bicycle. And I know that there's, that's obviously an extreme departure from what I was doing, but that gave me the headspace to think about all of these things. Had I just moved to a biotech company or had I moved uh, and immediately taken a high school teaching job, which especially for the first two or three years till you figure out your rap is like, one of the most time consuming things that you can do, I, I wouldn't have had the headspace to think about all these things. And so there is some amount of risk and there's some amount of risk of riding a bike through Honduras, but you know what? There's just as much risk riding a bike through downtown Detroit or downtown Philadelphia, where I'm originally from. So possibly more risk. Yeah, possibly more. <laughs> right. And I mean, if you, if I survived the South, like the South was rough because not only do drivers not like cyclists, but they go out of their way to actively harass cyclists. I had trash thrown at me, insults hurled, guys honking, like physically trying to force me off the road when I was in the South. So there was risk there. Risk was high there. But you just can't live your life in fear. And I think that that's what, that, what I'd like to show people, that there, there isn't that much to be afraid of. Like most of what we're afraid of is self-imposed. Most of what we're afraid of is the process of making a change. We're afraid of taking the risk and not the risk itself. These are the kind of things which I which I thought a lot about on the bike when there was challenge or when I had when I had something that like piqued my interest in a particular way. But yeah, there's also I mean, I, there's a lot of everything in life is a risk reward calculation. If I somebody reported a rare bird 100 miles off my route, well, it's one more species towards my total. But what's the what's the energetic cost of getting there? What's the chance it's going to be there once I am there? What's the chance that I get hurt either there or coming back? So there's there's always this risk reward calculation, but at the end of the day, you have to do what makes you happy. And I thought the bicycle would would make me happy for a year, and it has made me happier in the long term as a result. If you dwell on risk the whole time, you're just never going to get anywhere. And I think I think more of it is that it's there's always like a default option. It's always a default or a societally suggested or generally prescribed course and and if you walk run or ride that like your whole life you're like you're never you're never getting your head out of the out of the tire tracks like seeing high enough over the rut to see what else is out there and i mean academia for me was that way because i was good at it and i was really good at it in graduate school so i could get away with murder when it came to like coming into lab drunk and like partying and doing a, a lot of really dumb things because i I could always keep it on the academic rails. And so academia seemed like this perfect shelter for me because I didn't get challenged there a lot and I could behave badly as a result of that. Once I sobered up, I started to say like this, this structure doesn't work anymore because it's too comfortable. And that's when I decided to go and do the bicycle trip. Risk is all you have to manage it, but you can't let it paralyze you. I, I like the concept of a default route. Like you, mm -hmm. there's a default route for most professions. And uh, it's very easy to see how that default route will progress. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to think about alternatives to that default route. Uh, and, and in fact, I think one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast in the first place is there are so many people that want to make a difference in the environment. And when I talk to them, I find them stuck in their default path mm -hmm. and they don't really know how to do it. Sometimes it can be small things that can be done, volunteering. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it can be big things that can be done like what you did. Uh, so what, what I'm curious about for people that maybe are looking to 
create their own route, like a non-traditional path, what kind of advice would you have for them to get started on that mm -hmm. path? Yeah, I think the first thing you have to do is come up with an idea. You can't, you can, you can certainly walk into your job tomorrow and quit it. You can't walk into your family tomorrow and quit them. But there needs to be some amount of foresight that goes goes into a plan like figure out what winds you up and then say how could i leverage this to explore myself and interact with the world around me and sit around i mean like i said i conceived the idea for the bicycle big trip early november of 2012 and i didn't quit my job until mid-april of 2013 so effectively six months that i thought and thought do i want to do this can i do this how would i do this what is the route going to be where will i stay how can I learn how to ride a bike? I mean, I knew how to ride a bike as a kid, but, and like pour yourself into it and get a plan. And then once you have the plan, then it's just a function of taking the leap to go and do it. But I think it's, it's a mistake to, to depart. If you have a decent gig or you have something steady now, I think it's, it's a mistake to, to quit it and then say, what do I want to do? I think that as tiring, as tiring as your day may be, like, Finish your work and then come home and then say, how am I going to execute this plan and get everything lined, get all your ducks in a line before you leave? I think that identifying the idea is really hard. And then that last step of walking. I mean, I, I walked into my boss's office and was absolutely in tears telling him that I, I thanked him for the opportunity that he gave me. I mean, he funded my research for at that stage. It was two and a half years. And I ended up working out the rest of the year. I told him, I'm giving you eight months notice because I'm going to leave at the end of 2013 to do this bike trip at the beginning of 2014. He's like, I'll fund you through the rest of the year. But that, that last little hump of like quitting your job or making the decision to go do it, and it's just on you. You just have to decide, is this idea that I've conjured and that I've thought really hard about, like, is this, do I want this to be a part of my life? Do I want this to be a part of my story? And it may never go on your resume, and nobody beyond you may pay attention to it, but you have to believe that it's going to make your life better. And and just and that's where like if you think about it before you take the leap for a little while, other people might tell you the opposite. They might say just take the leap right away. And it depends what the project is. For me, I knew that I had to start on January one, and when I came up with the idea in the end of 2012, there wasn't enough time, and I wasn't yet out of my scientific career. I got some really discouraging results at the beginning of 2013. And once I got those results, I said, this is the time to fold my hand. But I gave myself the chance to do this, those experiments before I, before I folded that hand. But it's just about, it's just doing it. It's just going and doing it. Like, I think that we hear, we hear this all the time. Most of the people who tell you, oh, go and do it, haven't done it themselves. And so I think that it, I took the risk to go and do it and I'm so happy that I did. That's what it comes down to. So definitely some context in there as well. You mentioned that in some cases, maybe you do just drop everything, but mm -hmm. those, are, those are probably very rare cases. In this case, you spent six months thinking about it before mm -hmm. committing to it. And I imagine in that time, you, uh, while you weren't able to test out what it would be like to ride across country, mm -hmm. you were able to at least think it through, think about what's the worst case that might happen, yeah, what's yeah. the best case that might happen. Uh, yeah, and I mean, sort of the calculus that you were exactly. And I was in a, I was in a very unique position with my girlfriend, who ended up marrying after that year. So we ended up getting engaged the following year after I got back from the bike trip. We were lucky because she had partner health insurance. We weren't married, and her company offered partner health insurance because we've been cohabitating for more than a year. But I also took out like one of these high deductible, catastrophic, uh, catastrophic type plans in case I got clobbered and was in, paralyzed or crippled for the remainder of my life. And so those decisions weren't made lightly. And I had to think about those. It depends what you want to do. There's a, there's a difference between like traveling the world and like having a project where there's a goal to accomplish and you're putting yourself at, at physical and also emotional and professional risk. Like I, my track was so competitive that I knew that once I stepped out of it, I couldn't step back in. Like I knew that my scientific career was over. I could probably, I could step back into science and probably go teach at if I went back, if I had done the big year and then gone back and done a return to my lab or gone and done another postdoc, I could have gone and taught at a liberal arts school or, uh, but I couldn't have, I couldn't have been in the high powered world that the high powered university world where I was, it wasn't going to happen. There's just too many other hungry people waiting behind you. Shifting gears a little bit then, 
one thing that, that I really believe in when it comes to getting people excited about the environment, so shifting back to, uh, to that aspect of your big year, is uh, you know, a lot of times people don't even realize what is in their backyard. They may be walking by an interesting park that has animals, owls, whatever, and not realize it. So getting, getting people to see it for the first time and understand what's there is kind of the first hook to then progressing to caring about it. Mm -hmm. For all the people you've interacted with, the, you mentioned that you stayed with some bicycle, bicycle community people on your trip. Uh, I'm sure there's a better word than bicycle yeah, community yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. But you know, what, what did you find was effective in, in getting people interested or, or start to care about the birds, the habitat, the environment that sustains them? Yeah, this is, this is really where my photography comes into play because, I mean, people recognize the birds in their backyard and they might recognize a cardinal and a blue jay and those birds are stunning but they might not have seen a yellow-bellied sapsucker they might not have seen a says phoebe uh, or some of these other kind of like common not necessarily backyard birds but kind of forest edge birds so to speak or, or pasture birds and so i think that if you can show people pictures of things and be like this lives like right down the street from you people will be like oh wow i, I i've never seen that before and that's well you haven't been looking and you don't have binoculars and so as soon as you can get them in front of that bird with binoculars in their hand, like people start to make the connection of, oh my God, there's a lot of stuff around. And birds are, birds are particularly user-friendly that way. They are very difficult to see. They're more difficult to, say, to see than, say, an elephant or a lion, right? The difference, the difference being that elephants and lions aren't everywhere, right? So what's wonderful about birds is I, I can go birding in Central Park and see 100 species in a morning. I can go birding... Anywhere that I go, and I'm totally engaged, right? If you like large mammals, you're a bit more limited. But birds are really great because they're universal in, in every habitat, everywhere you go. And so I think that just showing people pictures of things uh, and saying, this is actually really near you, and you can, you can see this with, with just a little bit of effort, gets them going. Birding, the collecting aspect of it resonates with people. We talk about listing, and it's basically like a running list of birds that everybody keeps. And you have most birders have one for their yard, their county, their state, their home country. And once you get really obsessive, now the computer takes care of all of this for you because you can like basically live input your your sightings, and so it then kicks out your list for yeah, Thailand. There's an app for that now. Yeah, yeah there is they, an app for that. eBird, right? And so it's great. And so the the collecting aspect of, of things birding resonates with people and it's just you it's not like collecting pez dispensers where you sit in your basement and you and you're hitting buy on ebay right you actually have to go and look for the bird and you have to engage with the natural world to do that and i think that once people look at birding as a scavenger hunt even though that might be like the list might be the motivation to get them going once they start interacting with the birds and learning a bit about each species and their evolutionary history and their behavioral uh quirks and things then they get then they get hooked so, and the other thing is that getting kids involved. I mean, obviously I started really young. I mean, my parents would like lock me out of the house and like go entertain yourself. And like, I found two things to do. One was throw rocks at the commuter train that ran through our backyard. And the other one was look at birds while I was waiting for the next train to come to throw rocks at. So I just, I found it on my own. I got super curious, but there's all sorts of different outlets that you can take advantage of, like your local Audubon societies and local nature clubs. And I mean, there's all sorts of instructional videos and stuff online nowadays. So there's all kinds of ways to get involved. And it's really once people put their eyes on some of these beautiful birds for the first time that it, it registers. And it's like, wow, I didn't realize I could see that here. To tell people, I can go out. I went out on my bike with a couple of friends two years ago. And we saw like 180 species of birds in 24 hours just using our bikes. And people are like, I didn't know there were 180 species in the Bay Area. It's like that is just a 24 hour sample of what's in the Bay Area. And that like blew people's minds. Right. Yeah, I, I had a very similar experience recently. So I for my day job, I uh, travel occasionally. And whenever I travel, since birds are mm -hmm. so accessible, I always make sure I get out and, and see what I can see. And uh, I was recently down in Playa Vista in the L.A. area. Uh -huh. And I had maybe an hour and a half in the morning before things started. So I went for a walk and. So I don't know, about 50 species of birds in that mm -hmm. hour and a half. And I told some of my colleagues that, and you know, they were really surprised. Like, wow, really 50 species. I didn't realize like right here by the office, we had 50 species yeah, yeah. and you know, it kind of faded. But then later when I showed them a couple pictures of a hooded merganser mm -hmm. and there was a, there was a kingbird of some sort. I don't, uh -huh. I don't recall Cassin's. Yeah, yeah. You know, that really opened their eyes that made them want to go out mm -hmm. and look. 
So I, I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It's kind of coupling those two things together to drive that motivation. Yeah, I mean, I'd love, I mean, in my pipe dream world, we'd have an educational curricula that was centered on like environmental stewardship so that when you learn math, you're learning it through like a unit that is talking about like waste disposal and like you have this many pounds of this and this many pounds of that. And when you're learning about history, you're learning about the history of waterways and like how we've abused some of them and resurrected some of them. When you're learning about social studies, you're learning about like how people in different parts of the world look at the natural world. And so I think that like the more exposure you can give kids, the better the long-term outcomes are going to be. Because once, once adults, it's really hard to take an adult who has an established behavioral pattern and a lot of adult responsibility and, and change, completely change that person's thought process and their perception of the world. Whereas it's like if you show a kid a picture of an albatross choking on plastic, that kid who is super naive to how the world works is going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe people are letting that bird choke to death on, on discarded toothbrushes and bottle caps. Like, I want to help, right? Whereas adults say, I want to help, but I'm too busy. They don't have that like naive optimism that children have. And if you can get children involved like before they become too practical about things as adults, that's what you want because those people are then going to give you, not to say that adults, there's less return on investments with adults, but if you can get a seven-year-old involved, you're going to get 70 years of investment, right? Like a return on, on getting that person involved in the natural world. And they're more open to new ideas. Once people get older, they tend to get a bit more set in their ways. Yeah, I think I think it's human nature to fall into certain habitual patterns yeah. day in and day out. And if you're not thinking about the environment as part of your day-to-day -day life, it's hard to start to care about it. Um, so yeah, small steps, I suppose. Yeah. And, and I, think, I think that's an important thing. I mean, I, I went vegetarian last year strictly for environmental reasons. Well animal rights, resource management, like all of those things involved. And I had been, I'd been vegetarian for a year, a year in college and then gave it up after that and ate a very meat heavy diet for the next tw almost 20 years. But I just kind of said like, I can't, I can't sit and demand environmental action, environmental policy from those above me, which may or may not happen for various political reasons or financial reasons when I'm sitting there and I can make a really easy change in terms of going vegetarian, like boom, that not eating, if you can't go full vegetarian, like getting rid of red meat or riding your bike. Like I think that we all, we all are very good at asking for policy change, but we aren't quite as good about making individual sacrifices. And if we make those small, those individual sacrifices on a large scale ac across many people, then they will have an impact. If everybody who went to a climate march went vegetarian tomorrow, that would have infinitely better consequences than going to the climate march. So just something to think about. Yeah, I think there's a lot of a lot of data out there that is really surprising when you dig into it because it's very easy to see the car driving down the street and the exhaust coming out of it and, and, and saying, oh, that's bad. Uh, when you start to look at the food system and some other behaviors on a mass scale of 7 billion people mm -hmm. across the globe, it, uh, it really can dwarf some of the things that we think are, are the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, definitely the agriculture and food is something that we all need to look closely at. Yeah, and uh, just general consumption. I mean, it's, I mean, nobody wants to hear we should scale back Christmas, but like most of what's given at Christmas is stuff that's going to be discarded before the next Christmas anyway, right? So just not buying as much stuff, buying fewer but nicer things as opposed to a bunch of junk that's just going to end up on the scrap heap. Like these are... These are these conscious type decisions. I try to buy as much stuff as I can used. Like if there's a pair of pants at a Goodwill, give it to me. The more stuff we can buy used, like these are the these are the little decisions. Like driving a car past when society tells you a car is like acceptably old. Like changing a car every three or four years is a little bit dubious, right? Like Yeah, so. I, I, I have to say that one really resonates with me. I had an old Honda Civic. And I, uh, every year I said one more year and I kept doing that over yeah. and over and over. And then unfortunately I got rear ended on the highway. Oh. So the decision, my hand was forced. Yeah. At that yeah. Point. And like, that's going to happen. Like if you drive a car into the ground, but I mean, there's a pressure in the U S and it's incredibly frustrating consumerism where it's like, everybody has to have the latest and greatest all the time. We define success through material possessions versus how we should define, i.e. how we treat other people, how we take care of those who don't have as much as us, how we treat the environment. Um, those are the measures of human beings, not what you own. So I appreciate all of the time you've given me here today oh, yeah, for no this problem. interview. I, I do have a couple of quick questions yes. to wrap up with. 
Are these meant as rapid fire? So I should not give you these like rambling answers well, I've given you till now. Th th these really aren't rapid fire questions. I okay. know we, we had talked about maybe doing some rapid <laughs> fire, but you've actually touched on almost everything I would have oh, asked good. anyway. Okay. So, you know, first you've mentioned your book a few times. Do you have any release dates or any no. plans you want to share yet? No, it's the writing is almost done. Uh, the writing will be done in June. It's been a, it's been a long battle because it took me, I worked the full time, like 60 hours a week to two years after my big year. So I didn't write anything. And then once I started writing, I hadn't, I'd never written a book and it, it took a long time to try to figure out most big year books are like, this is what happened during my big year. Whereas this is a bit more personal in that it's my entire life being examined through the lens of my big year, whether that be my personal insecurities surrounding academia, uh, my issues with alcoholism, my intimacy issues that like stem from the, some of these other problems. So it's taken a long time to figure out how to tell the story in a way that is coherent. So that process is done. I'm now just kind of like smoothing out the writing. And then hopefully the second half of this year, I've started the publishing battle, waiting to hear back from people. It's probably going to be at least a year from now before like there's, even if somebody says yes tomorrow, it's going to be the end of the year before there's a physical book. So it's going to take some time and I'm sure that we can even do a follow up some future point. But sit tight. It's coming. I promise. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds fascinating. I like the approach that you're planning mm -hmm. to take, and definitely I'll keep an eye on that and be sure to let people know when Excellent. Thank the day you. comes. And absolutely, if you would be inclined to talk again, I would I would take you up on that. Yeah, you know, I'm I like the sound of my own voice, and I love doing I love doing these sorts of interviews where I get to kind of put my love for birds into a framework and context that could potentially inspire other people to either get involved with birds or chase whatever passion that they have kind of let stagnate or haven't yet found. So I really love this kind of outlet. And uh, you mentioned photography a lot during the course of the discussion oh, yeah. day. And as we're sitting here, I see some of the artwork you have on the wall. All of it is your photography. Yeah, yeah. So that's maybe a good lead in. You know, I think you do, you, you're active on social media. Uh, where can people find you? Where yeah. can they see your work? So I have an Instagram account. I've kind of been lazy with Instagram in the last few months, actually, because I've been so wrapped up with writing. But my Instagram is Dorian underscore Anderson underscore photography. So it's really easy. And then my website is DorianAndersonPhotography.com. That's easy as well. But yeah, I mean, I do stuff on Facebook, but usually just arguing politics and stupid stuff on Facebook. But I try to – Instagram is like only – only professional, what I consider professional level content. Like I'm not posting pictures of what I eat and my new shoes. It's like all bird content that I think people would find interesting. Mm -hmm. And my photography website's the same way. So it's, it's all, I, every once in a while I find myself in front of another animal and I will photograph it. But like 99% of what's on my website is all bird photography. But I've been fortunate to travel to a lot of really cool places and I drag my camera everywhere that I go. So there's some really cool pictures of birds from all over the world there. All right. Uh, yeah. And I can vouch for that. I follow you on Instagram and it's, it's great work and I see it here in front of my eyes on your wall. So yeah, this was like all my wife's idea. She was like really insistent on having, once we bought a place, she was like, we need to actually have some of your art up there. So this was what we decided to decorate. So we've got a whole bunch of them. printing these nature pictures on this, on these metal plates or on glass plates. Looks so it looks so good. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. I really yeah, appreciate cheers. it. I really appreciate time. it, Michael. And, yeah. And, and take care and keep us informed as to your upcoming adventures. Yes, definitely. Thanks so much. All right. Cheers. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work. So please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season, where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring, 
and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.